glad to see you back on the platform for investor education people. Thus far, we have addressed risk many times on the site. We've said things like manage your risk and the returns will come. But it's time to get serious about this risk business now. As you know, our preference is to look at equity data from the beginning of this current century. Table 1 in column 3 reports the value of the Nifty at the end of each year and the annual returns that investing in that Nifty index would have generated for you. Annual returns simply represent the rate of return you would have earned if you had bought the Nifty at the start of the year and sold it at the end of the year. It's not the CAGR of 11% which many of you might be comfortable with. So let's take a first pass at risk. Focus on that third column of annual returns. You see some years with positive returns and some with negative returns. The next column, column 4 of this table, sorts these annual returns in ascending order and you see the spread in returns more clearly. This spread is statistically known as the range. The extremes are about negative 52% in 2008 and positive 75% in 2009. Wild swings, you can say, but those were the years of the global financial crisis. Take them out and there is still some annual variation. Still, the Nifty returns annually show more positive years than negative years, more double-digit returns than single-digit ones. For those of you who know some statistics, this is not quite how a normal or a Gaussian distribution behaves, right? But since the year-over-year -year returns do change, we look at their standard deviation. This calculates out to 31.59%, a ratio of one to the other, known as the coefficient of variation, is about 200% and compares reasonably well with other markets. Another way to read the standard deviation is to think that if the distribution was normal, roughly two-thirds of the time, returns can be one standard deviation around the mean. This leads to a spread from negative 16% to positive 47%. Remember, of course, this is suspect since the annual return distribution wasn't that normal anyway. But it is still wide variation. These annual returns, even though they average in double digits for the last century are certainly not assured. Let's compare this with the return on a treasury bond and introduce a couple of other notions that you will find useful as we proceed. That treasury bond promises you a rate of about 7% these days with none of this volatility. You can think of this 7% therefore as a risk-free rate. The extra 8 or 9 percent return that you earn from equities from owning the Nifty outright on average can be thought of as a risk premium. It is the extra return above that risk-free rate of 9 that you have historically earned for taking on the risk that comes with Nifty ownership. Where do these risks come from? We can do these calculations with daily returns or monthly returns. We can calculate returns and standard deviations for individual stocks, as well as for indexes and portfolios. Of course, they too will show some variation. But think of the source one more time. Returns come from where? They come from prices. And prices fluctuate with the fortunes of companies, more specifically the quality of their earnings and the quantity of them. If you think of a simple profit-loss P&L statement, we can take a stab at identifying some broad risk sources. The top portion of a P&L reflects risks emanating from the operations of the company. The lower half of that P&L reflects risks that are more financial in nature. For instance, if a company has a lot of debt on its balance sheet, then the interest component that is reflected in the P&L will be large, will it not? These are some examples of the sources of risk that apply to all companies. If you owned only one stock, then that standard deviation measure that we calculated for you earlier will capture 
the total amount of risk inherent in such ownership. We've talked about portfolios of stocks, we've talked about diversification. So what happens when we preach the virtue of diversification? What happens to risk exposure and risk measurement? If diversi diversification reduces risk, how does it do that? If you own equities in many companies, then the individual risks of any one company should matter less, shouldn't it? Some firm specific risks cancel out in the portfolio. One company has good managers, another has bad ones. One company has products that sell well, another has products that bomb. What matters now is not the total risk, but what portion of that individual firm's risk, that portion of that individual standard deviation, does the ownership of each equity add to your portfolio of equities? There is a lot of argument and debate and theory supporting this, but I think you get a general sense of it. Said differently, some risk can be diversified away and other risks cannot. It is this latter risk that is relevant from a portfolio perspective and this latter risk is measured by a statistical quantity known as a beta. By construction, the Nifty is said to have a beta of 1, a market beta. Figure 1 shows you a scatter plot of a company called Edelweiss Financial compared with that of the returns to the Nifty Index. Each point in that plot represents one pair of daily returns and there are 234 trading days, all the trading days of 2019 in the various data points. You can see from that scatter plot how Edelweiss returns move with Nifty returns. You can also see a trend line that has a slope of 1.82. This slope is a measure of the beta of Edelweiss. And this is how betas of all companies relevant to some market index would be calculated. A level of 1.82 for Edelweiss means, of course, that Edelweiss is more volatile than the Nifty. Other stocks in the Nifty may have a beta below 1. Indeed, the National Stock Exchange itself provides a high beta index, which is comprised solely of high beta stocks, higher risk with the expectation of higher returns. As you get more serious with your analysis of stocks, I want to reiterate three things. First, statistics assumes normal distributions for returns, as I have said earlier, but this is not always the case. Second, estimates of risk can be generated from returns of different frequencies within the day, daily, weekly, monthly, and you realize more data is always better to get better estimates. Third, and perhaps the single most important assumption in what we've talked about is the notion that beta risk is the only risk that matters when it, when it comes to evaluating portfolio component risk. There are other models that people in my tribe have come up with. We provide more explicit details of this beta calculation and other calculations in the deep dives that accompany our topic. As always, we hope to see you again and expect you to come back for more.